Well, welcome back to the uh, podcast, uh, Sermon Extra. We have been gone for a week, but uh, now we are back. It is time to uh, kind of break down and chat a little bit about uh, about our sermon this week. Uh, before we get started, uh, again, we do have uh, on the app, you can find uh, all of our past sermons, uh, messages, both audio and video. And, uh, and here on our YouTube channel, uh, love to have you uh, check out some of our other content too. But uh, it's helpful if you weren't in worship uh, physically to check out that sermon ahead of time, or what we're talking about may not make total sense to you, or hopefully it makes a little bit because it is scripture. But I think, Pastor John, you wanted a little recap of last uh, sermon? Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Scott. Um, no, it's good to be back together. And uh, um, certainly, uh, since we missed, it was the Monday of uh, Memorial Day that we didn't have our podcast. And so I just wanted to go back just really quickly, quickly and briefly to um, that sermon that I preached. Basically, it was an interlude where uh, I know, Pastor Dustin, you preached on chapter five on Melchizedek. And then uh, the preacher takes this kind of pause on that theme. And then, Andy, you picked it up again yesterday. Uh, but uh, I, I started off by talking about boot camp and how people, um, when we you know face combat, when our men and women in uniform faced uh, war or whatever, they don't go back to the basics, but they use those basics to, to engage the enemy. And one of the thoughts that just kind of kind of bounced around my heart, I guess afterward, was this thought just sticking with maybe military theme. When has our country, been most unified over the course of its history? When have people worked closest together? When have we been more unified in purpose? And the answer kept coming back to me is when time of conflict, in time of war. Uh, now, that doesn't mean there weren't protests and things like that. But the idea was, um, it's in those moments when we're facing an identified enemy that we band together, we come together, we train together, um, people sacrifice together, you name it. When have we been most um, disunified? I think it's during long stretches of um, affluence, uh, peace, uh, prosperity, because people tend to um, retreat back into their own families or into their own lives. And instead of needing each other, we're all very self-sufficient. And I think one of the things uh, that the reason this notion was bouncing around in my head and my heart was in that sermon, I talked about, we're in a very real battle for souls. I mean, this is a very serious, I mean, Satan and his, his fallen angels are after souls. And uh, one of the kind of the, in the vernacular, we'll say that we're about depopulating hell. You know, we want to get people into heaven. We want to keep them from eternal separation from God. And I think, um, and if I could use woke in a positive sense, we need to, we need to awaken to the fact that we are in a battle. And if we do so as a church, I think we'll never be more unified. But if the people of God don't really see this as a battle, if they don't see this as a fight, then we tend to spend more time relaxed, spend more time going back uh, to two drift. We drift, yeah, yeah, we, uh, yeah. We are lost at sea, like I brought up this week. You know, we're to right. and fro with different political things and agendas, or we, you know, we have that anchor. Is what the right, is the right. So, really, that was just the bridge that I, I wanted to bring up today before we get into where you picked up with Melchizedek again, because the battle's real. We as a as a as a as a church, capital C, all over the face of the planet, but also small C, Messiah. We need to get it that this is something going on in our world, in our lives right now. And in order to really be effective in depopulating hell would be to, uh, to move from the basics, to mature in our faith, as the writer says, not need milk, but solid food. Again, there's no shame if where you're at on that spectrum of like just entering into a relationship with Jesus or you've been a lifelong follower. But the point is we're all moving in the direction of stronger growth, stronger discipleship. And then activating that and making it a priority so that we can take the battle to the enemy. And so anyway, that was just something I, I, I wanted to bring up after um, uh, getting out of the pulpit uh, a week ago. 
uh, was if I had time, I would have maybe explored that concept. So I've thought about that in a similar way, but I guess looking at it a little different. So if you think in terms of as a nation and as a community and a people, but even in our individual lives, I've talked about how we often have these mountaintop experiences in mm -hmm. life. And typically that's when life is going really good and we want to stay in that moment, but it's often short lived. And opposite of that are the valleys, which are these dark, scary places. And yet often, I think that's when we typically grow in our faith mm -hmm. the most because it's out of our control and we find ourselves calling upon God. But in between those two is just kind of the normal everyday ebb and flow of life. And I feel like that's the most dangerous place to live because at least for me, that's typically where I rely on myself the most. And I was just thinking that yeah. in, in terms of, you know, when there's conflict, when there's war, right, we come together, we unite together. But I think even in our, only, our own individual lives, there is this battle that's going on too. Yeah. Um, between, you know, with sin and Satan at work and that battle between what's right and wrong. And I think that's a part with the writer, the preacher of Hebrews is proclaiming preaching to a people who are struggling too with, man, I'm being persecuted. There's these hard things going on uh, culturally as a people, but probably in their individual lives. And do I continue as a follower of Jesus or do I go back to the older way of life, how we did things? And so I think we all deal with that at different times too but yep. how important it is where hebrews begins is like listen god is speaking yeah so listen and and to be turning to his word then well and and as we get into this um scholars uh in different commentaries and stuff have agreed that the chapter six part that we covered memorial day weekend is the heart of this message and so I can't help but think that the people in, in that time in, in the, of, the, of the original preaching of this were also saying, hey, I'm in that moment, um, not in the valley or the hill or the mountaintop, but, but there's, a, there's a drifting that's taking place because he's like, hey, people, I need you to go from milk to solid food. And the reason for this is very, very real. And, and so then he says, all right. Uh, I've, I've kind of um, poked you. I've kind of uh, caused a little bit of discomfort here. Now let's get back into Jesus as high priest. And I love how it's bookended because as you brought in a great message of peace, comfort, and strength, and then, of course, I get the message where I got to poke everybody. <laughs> you know, I'm like, come on. Um, and then, and then uh, Andy, you were able to bring in a message again of saying, hey, this is... Jesus, high priest. And so, yeah, take it well, away. What I was going to say, it almost it almost feels a little bit like the preacher is, is coming back here for a reason. And he took that pause because it's almost like these, these Jewish Christians, I think maybe you and I were talking about this, are almost like it would be a lot easier to just go to the synagogue and and make sure we do these certain prayers and, you know, are following the commandments and going back to the old covenant and the old way of the law. And so that's why I think he jumps back in and is, is reiterating the new priesthood. And the new covenant, which is coming next in chapter eight. And so um, I think that's why this, there's so much in here. Like I said, I could have preached for, for hours on this, but bringing in this new priesthood that, that Jesus is the great high priest by the order of Melchizedek. And I think he's really trying to show them that this is different. This is a new thing and this is a better thing. And it's that better hope. And so um, I think that's really what this is all about is, is making sure, I think I mentioned this, making sure that they get it. And they make sure that they know this is the anchor. And, you know, it talks about how the law was not able to make it perfect. And, and Melchizedek was before the law. And then obviously tying it to Jesus and the, and the better hope that comes through it. And so um, I think that's really what this is all about, is making sure these Jewish Christians stay the Christian part. And don't go back maybe what their, their family heritage was or, or what they were, maybe even a short time prior to knowing, knowing the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so... Um, I think that's the biggest thing that, that I really resonated with was that he's really trying to raise Jesus up as the high priest and, um, and what that means for them. But um, the one thing that I think uh, the, the note that I hope people took was when we look at Melchizedek, we should see Jesus. And that's really the big thing here. And, and there's a lot of different scholarly looks at that and, and how were they related. And, and obviously in the psalm, it, it points toward Jesus and, and the coming Messiah through this this uh, priesthood, but the one thing that, that I think it, it speaks to us is he was, uh, Melchizedek 
was a priest, not because of his genealogy. And I said, not because of his birth certificate, which family he came from, because of what God said, that oath, God saying who he was and, and hearing about it through scripture. And so I said, just like us, you know, no matter what your family situation is like, no matter what, you know, you're, you're born into this world in a certain family and your genealogy. And sometimes that's a great thing. And your family raises you in, in a great way. But sometimes it's a broken, broken thing. But because God in our baptism says who we are, we're his, forgives us our sins, washes us from those, and then give us, gives us that promise of life and salvation with him. That was the big thing that I took from Melchizedek is it's very similar and it speaks to us in that same way, which I thought was cool. Yeah, I like uh, one of the things that I think you said it, um, I don't remember if it was at the beginning or where it was in the message, but um, I think it was toward the beginning. We don't know a lot about Melchizedek mm -hmm. and we really can't make assumptions. I think there's a, there's a desire a lot of times to, to fill in the blanks ourselves uh, with our thoughts, our ideas, our wonderings, mm -hmm. musings, whatever. And, and some, there's a place for those. There's a place for us to, uh, to use our imaginations. But what does Scripture tell us? And, and what I liked was you connected, again, that Old Testament figure pointing us to Jesus. I think is exactly what you said. When you see Melchizedek, he points us directly to Jesus. Um, but I, I really appreciated, too, how separating out the two lines of mm -hmm. priests mm -hmm. And how Jesus is the only one in the lineage of Melchizedek. You got Levi and tons of priests. Thousands. You mentioned, yeah, thousands. <laughs> you know, and you Many. mentioned some of the bad ones too. Yeah, yeah. Good ones, bad ones. Um, but there's only one in the lineage. I just think that's it's fascinating mm -hmm. that Melchizedek, we see Jesus. All right, now I'm going to interject because I've heard about three different pronunciations of that name. <laughs> <laughs> and I actually Googled it because that's what tech guys do. All right. Melchizedek. 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 I was saying keys. I think that's how I said You were saying it. keys. I think, and, I think Dustin with, had it right. Yeah, I know. I, I always side with the You were going back and forth, kind of trying to, okay. Well, we want to satisfy feel. everybody. I mean, Mel we wanted a little bit of everything. Melchizedek. No, this is the law. Yeah. Melchizedek. At least that's what And I, from what I gather, Bible speak it doesn't translate well to English in and of itself as far as king of righteousness you know one of the cool things about this too and you brought this up was the the meaning yeah. of, you know king of righteousness but he's also the king of uh salam mm -hmm. or salem as we sometimes say and it's really cool how historically where he would have been king then would be where the temple would be built that's right. where jesus yeah would that's be crucified. fantastic i to, mean to, it's, to it's hear that. so the lineage even by geography was it's just fascinating. Yeah, and there was just so much about him that just absolutely screamed Jesus. When he met Abraham, mm -hmm. I mean, first of all, he, he blessed Abraham, which being right there in the origin of, of God's story working through Abraham. But what did he have when he blessed him? And I know there wasn't a lot of goods to be had, but he had bread and wine. Mm -hmm. You know, he blessed him with bread and wine. So he had that there, which would later become to be what Jesus uses to, to pass on and, and um, institute the new covenant. So that was just a cool picture too. And, and just the fact that, you know, I love what the Hebrew preacher is preaching about. He's saying he, Abraham tithed to him as the high priest. And then he, he does the beautiful summary of saying, Hey, if, if someone tithes to you, you are greater than the one that did the tithing showing, just raising up Melchizedek, Melchizedek <laughs> from, <laughs> you know, above Abraham. And I just, I, that really just sets the tone for how big of a deal this priestly order is. And then when you see that the only one that came from came came beyond Melchizedek <laughs> is Jesus, so that, I just thought that was just it, basically what what the preacher was doing is saying this is something to pay close attention to. So something we didn't get into, but I think it it could be a whole other discussion mm -hmm. and tithing and yeah. why it's important that we say when we tithe, it's it's an act of worship. Mm -hmm. We are giving not to the pastor not to the church, and as in like Messiah, mm -hmm. although that's our, our vehicle by which we give, but we are giving to the Lord because he is superior. And I, I'd never really thought about that in terms of a stewardship yeah. um, focus that, that Abraham tithed to Melchizedek. And, uh, and you know, again, we, 
No, that's all right. We're going to do it right. We're going to do it. I always tell people when you're reading names in the Bible. Yeah, yeah, it takes a while. Whenever you read names, just do it with force. And yep. Everybody will think you know what you're talking Old about. Old Uncle Mel. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I was calling him all week. So, <laughs> Mel. So, uh, but anyway, I just, I, I hadn't really looked at the yeah. whole idea of it being a stewardship theme mm-hmm. in terms of tithes acknowledging the superiority of God. And so that our gifts are an act of worship. And it's not unlike how we talk about it in worship as well, because in that case, Abraham was coming back from a battle, getting Lot and the family back. And and obviously Melchizedek, who is the king of peace in, in a sense, um, in the term peace, um, was blessing him in a time of peace after that big mm-hmm. struggle. But then, you know, Melchizedek was saying, God delivered you, that your enemy is into your hand. And, and yeah. was basically saying, God's, God gives it all to you. Yep. And so that was Abraham returning a portion of all that God's done for him. In fact, these were spoils of war. So it was exactly what we talked about. All that God's given us so much, our daily bread and then some and then some and then some. And we're able to bring worshipfully bring a portion of that back. And that's exactly what we talked about. It's exactly how it unfolded back in Abraham's time. Same thing. Yeah. So the piece, I guess, that kind of jumped out to me, or at least it just got me thinking, and this connects with where we're going yep. Yep. next, this next Sunday in Hebrews 8, and how Jesus is better, and there's this better covenant, this new covenant. But Melchizedek, I knew this, but I guess I haven't really thought about it a whole lot. But what you said, Andy, really got me thinking. He was priest and king before God had really, or at least through the Israelites, established that priestly line, the Levites, or even the monarchy, the king, with Saul and David. So it seems that there was this way that God intended things to work in a good and godly way. But, and he I really, when you read the Old Testament, God wanted his people to be a light into these other nations and to, to bring his word to them. They just kept falling in love with the culture that they were a part of and realized that the more kings they had, the more evil they were. Of the priests they had, yes, they were good, but there were a lot of bad priests too. And so there was a need for something better. And Jesus is prophet, priest, king, not just better, but the best. And and that becomes true, I think, of covenant, which is what we come to then in, in chapter 8, is all along God has wanted this covenant relationship with his people to be God to us and with us. Uh, but we see the effect that sin and brokenness has in all of that. And I'm just reminded that Jesus doesn't do His purpose isn't to do away with all of these Old Testament things. It's to fulfill it, to make it new, to make it better. And I think that's true of what it means to be priest and king and prophet. And it's also true of what it means within our covenant relationship with God. So that's kind of where we're going a little bit this next Sunday. More to come. A little hint. A little bit. Well, and and not to get too far ahead of ourselves, but in chapter 9, which I'll bring up after that, you see uh, Jesus living out that covenant as high priest into the place of the Holy of Holies. And it it does a lot of connection again with Old Testament sacrificial system and Jesus. And uh, chapter 9 is just chocked full of wonderful imagery. And so it'll build upon that new covenant. But uh, people should read ahead. They should read ahead. They should read ahead. There it is. You got your prep work, everybody. You but we also have prep work for Sunday. Sunday. So, what's going to happen Sunday? Oh, we're going to talk about this? I, I know. know. Are we going Vicar there? No know. more. Are we I doing this? Vicar no more. we got to at least say something about it. I mean, it's pretty special. I'm excited. Yeah. I was going to say your graduation, but I told my wife. I told my wife last night, I've been excited about this day for a very long time. Awesome. Um you know, as you become a seminarian, as you become a vicar, you, you kind of see that that light at the end of at least the, the time period that I've come through so far. Um, but it still hasn't sunk in, yeah. and it won't until yeah. 3 p.m.-ish. Right. Well, actually, Pastor John's preaching, so 3.15. Oh, come on. <laughs> next Sunday. <laughs> well, until you go, to, go, go home and you yeah. have the collar still on. Yes, right. I told everybody everything's going to change. Yeah, my right. wardrobe, yeah. my <laughs> yes. jewelry. No, okay. Um, <laughs> um, you know, and, and that's what I actually love about it is is what God is going to be doing, and what He does through the ordination of of called men into the, the pastoral ministry. It's it's huge, but at the same time, 
it's him at work and I will still be Andy yeah. and I will still be a part of the body of believers and the royal priesthood that we all are. I'm just set aside for those pastoral duties. And so it's, it's beautiful in how, how different and the same it is at the same time. Right. If you can say that. And, and I'll, again, people reading ahead or going back, I'm going to use as our text the beginning of chapter 5, which we already hit on, but I'm going to go back through the lens of ordination. And so if you read ahead, mm -hmm. it becomes very apparent why that's a, a great text for ordination. Yeah. So It's going to be Andy. It's time for solid food, man. No more milk. <laughs> <laughs> that's chapter 6. Oh, I guess that's part of chapter 5. Yeah, that's <laughs> That's the part. I was like, man, now we're, we're graduating yeah. you to solid food. Exactly. No man. more pureed peas. Yeah. No. Have, you, have you experienced, I mean, I know not personally, but have you witnessed an ordination before? Not in person. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've seen, I've seen like video footage and I've seen things happen, but yeah. not in person. And a lot of photos post. Because yeah. you'll experience it, but there is something powerful yeah. about when you have the laying out of hands and scripture mm -hmm. being spoken yeah, yep. over you. Yep. See that. Yeah. You can't really put it into words. And that's what's incredible is I ask, so, so what do I need to do to prepare for this event? You just need to be there. And so yeah. I, I have a lot of other people that are doing incredible work to put this together. And so I, I look forward to just being in, being at the heart of it in, in a cool way. It's going to be excellent. Two yes, o'clock. Two o'clock. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks again for coming yeah. and joining. It's nice to be back together yes. again nice. for a podcast. And uh, for those that are watching, again, you can uh, subscribe and uh, click on notifications and like. And uh, we're going to try to continue this. Uh, I've got a couple weeks off coming up end of June, start of July, where we'll take another break. But otherwise, we're going to keep on rolling Mondays. It's a good thing. Looking forward to it. Glad to have All you right. guys here. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Scott.